Okay, so here we go. Chapter, uh, part three of my lecture on Kapinski's Healthcare Finance, uh, sixth edition. Um, so we're going to finish up talking about the income statement and statement of changes in owner's equity and do a little napkin math uh, on calculating uh, cash flows. Okay, so we're going to continue with a discussion about net income. So uh, the income statement of many not-for-profit corporations can contain a section you know, below the net, uh, the net income line that reconciles uh, net income uh, with the balance sheet, uh, uh, net assets or equity account. So um, we can use, we, we use uh, Sunnyvale uses a separate statement, so we'll get into that in a minute. Um, economic profitability is, is, is complicated in case you couldn't tell by now um, because of the fact that um, uh, uh, gains and losses are not uh, easy, uh, matched by easily identifiable measurable events. Um, so we have to kind of have a, a sense, you have to develop a sense over time of what these things mean. Uh, and then of course your accounting staff has to do a good job accurately portraying, um, uh, the transactions. Okay. So, um, so let's say, uh, we are an organization, a hospital, a not-for-profit hospital, and we do, in fact, have uh, profit or excess of revenue over expense um, or a positive change in net assets. Um, if we have that, if we actually have net income, right, positive net income, so meaning we spent uh, less than we brought in, uh, all of that money if we're a not-for-profit, all of that money has to be retained uh, in the organization and used to further the mission of the organization. So I mentioned in part one, not-for-profits have a non-distribution constraint, meaning if they, have, um, if they have net income, if they have profit, they cannot distribute that profit to the, to the owners in the form of a dividend. And the reason that not-for-profits can't do that is because they don't have any owners, right? A not-for-profit is owned kind of in this nebulous way by the community or by stakeholders. Um, and it is not owned uh, by uh, uh, investors. For a for So all of the money has to be retained uh, by, if a not-for-profit has, has profit, any excess uh, resources have to be retained by the organization um, uh, and used by the organization to further its mission. On a for-profit business, net income is that residual earning, right? Uh, so an, a, a, that belongs to the owners of the business. So if a organization makes $100 in profit, uh, excuse me, in revenue, $100 in revenue, and it has $90 in expenses, including, say, maybe interest that has to be paid to uh, debt holders, and there's $10 left in profit, that is a residual earning. And by, uh, and by law, it belongs to the owners of the business. Um, so the owners of the business have the right to take that money out in the form of the business in the form of a dividend or they can leave the money with the business just like a not-for-profit, right? They don't have to take the money out. They can leave it in the, uh, with the business, with the managers of the business and allow the managers to reinvest the money and uh, buy new equipment or expand uh, the uh, services provided by the organization. So, uh, when the money is retained by the business, it's called retained earnings. Uh, when the money is paid out by the business, it's referred to as a dividend. Okay. So not-for-profits never pay dividends. They always retain all their earnings. Um, so uh, accrual, because of accrual accounting, that net income, though, doesn't necessarily represent actual cash. 
um, that that uh, an actual increase in cash that the organization has on hand, right? Because some of the cash might not be coming in until 45 days later, you know, after the end of the year or, or some other amount, you know, farther down the line. So some, and then on top of that, some income state items uh, represent cash coming and going and some don't. Um, so you remember we had a lengthy discussion about depreciation being just a kind of a placeholder to represent economic resources that are being used, but there's no cash associated with them. The cash was paid a long time ago, you know, a year or more ago. So if you have a 30 year old building, you know, you paid to build that building 30 years ago, but you're still depreciating it. You're still charging yourself nine more years worth of depreciation. So if all we have is income statement data, um, we can estimate the cash flow, um, the amount of additional cash or the amount of uh, 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 decrease in cash that an organization has had over the course of, uh, of a period, let's say a year, um, because that's typically what we're talking about with financial statements. Um, so we can estimate the cash flow, which is where est we're, we're um, representing a CF. So CF, cash flow, can be estimated by taking the net income and adding any non-cash expenses back to net income. So uh, in the example, the Sunnyvale example we've been working with, the only non-cash expense was depreciation. So Sunnyvale had $7.8 million in net income and $6.4 million in depreciation. So when we add the $6.4 million back to the $7.8 million, we get $14.2 million. Um, in cash flow. So what does that mean? Well, the organization said it, it earned $7.8 million this year, but in fact, it had $14.2 million come into the organization. So does that mean it had it, the net income is wrong? Well, no, it means that cash flow represents something different than net income, right? Net income represents um, an economic measure of profitability cash flow represents how much cash is actually in the bank. Okay. Um, and so the two are actually really important. And if you're a senior manager for a, uh, for a hospital or a large clinic or a physician practice, you're going to want to pay attention to both because you could have a positive net income um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and have, um, you know, insufficient cash flow to keep paying uh, your employees and keep paying your um, uh, uh, creditors and keep paying, um, you know, uh, all your other bills because you, you need cash to pay your bills. Net, net income is not going to do it. Okay. Um, so the income statements for uh, investor owned and not for profit businesses are very similar. Like I said, there's like a 95, probably 99% overlap. Some of its, some of the differences are terminology, but there are some, uh, some significant changes, um, some significant differences uh, in the way uh, that things are reported. Um, so revenues and cost organizations line up. Uh, they're very similar um, regardless of how they're owned. Um, but, uh, but say income taxes, um, not-for-profits don't pay income taxes, so it only applies to for-profit uh, uh, businesses. So, um, and and that can have a significant impact the, uh, uh, on the profitability of an entity. So we're going to look at that now and talk about how uh, depreciation can impact cash flow. So remember, we want we want a high amount of cash flow, right? An organization can show low net income and still have a very high amount of cash flow. And at the end of the day, cash flow is really what matters because cash flow is what pays the bills, pays the employees, pays, the, uh, pays to keep the lights on. Um, so what we have here is, this is gonna be a little confusing, but what we have here is um, uh, the Sunnyvale information. Uh, for 2015. Um, and then we have uh, four columns. So 
first we have uh, uh, Sunnyvale as if it were a not-for-profit, which I think the way we've been working with it in the book, it is a, a not-for-profit. Uh, uh, so column one, the, the NFP, not-for-profit. And T equals zero means that it's paying no taxes, right? Because it's a not-for-profit, it doesn't pay income taxes. So then we have uh, column two, we're treating Sunnyvale as if it were a for-profit and is paying a 20% tax rate. Then we have it as a for-profit paying a 40% uh, tax rate. And then we have it as a for-profit paying 40% tax, but having no depreciation. And that will, uh, hopefully that will become the impact of, of depreciation. The point of showing this is, uh, is the, the impact of depreciation on um, the income tax uh, paid by the organization. Okay, so um, let's start by looking, uh, let, well, let's do this line by line. I guess that's probably the best way to do it. Um, so starting with the total revenues line, um, uh, total revenue is gonna come in the same regardless of whether you're a not-for-profit or a for-profit. So the total revenue line for all four entities is 174,000. And then we've got our expenses, right? So this is our kind of a, 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 sim a simplified income statement. So we have our revenues, then we have our expenses and we're breaking our expenses up into two categories. First category is all the expenses except depreciation and then the second category is depreciation. So this is all our expenses other than depreciation and then depreciation. Um, and so again, everybody's the same going across. We had $159,000 in, in salaries and supplies and insurance costs and um, uh, whatever uh, uh, interest and, and whatever else there was in, in the list. And then we had $6,405,000 in depreciation. And so we use the same amount of depreciation for all the first three variations of our tax status. And then we, for demonstration purposes, we're gonna zero out our depreciation. Okay, so depreciation is an expense. And to get to our taxable income, um, we need to, so, so taxable income is going to be uh, our revenues minus our expenses, um, gives us our taxable income if you're a taxable entity. So just kind of skipping the not-for-profit column and going to the, um, the, for pro the first for-profit column, we have revenues of 174, total expenses, part of which is depreciation of 6.4 million, leaves us with taxable income of 7.8 million. We calculate um, our taxes are going to be 20% of our taxable income. So 0.2 times 7.8 gives us 1.57. And that leaves us with 6.28 million in net income. Uh, and I'll come back to cash flow in a second. So over here, um, so everybody's got 166 million except for, uh, in, in expenses, except for uh, the version where we're leaving out depreciation. So let's do these three first. Uh, taxable income in, in each of these cases is 7.8 million, except of course, this is a not-for-profit, so they don't pay any taxes, right? So their status is not-for-profit, so they're not gonna pay any taxes. So their net income is 7.86 million. We already did the 20%, the 40% tax bracket, right? We had that same 7.8 million in, in taxable income, but because they're in the 40% tax bracket, they're gonna pay 40% of that 7.8, which is 3.1 million. So 7.8 minus 3.1 gives us net income of 4.7 million. Now, let's assume over here that we don't have any depreciation. Now this is not a realistic assumption. Um, uh, except for very rare exceptions, um, organizations are always going to have depreciation. Um, so, uh, because if you, it, the only way you wouldn't have any depreciation is if you didn't own anything at all. Um, so this is really, uh, really just meant to be kind of a straw man to, to demonstrate uh, the principle here. So, 
Um, so we don't have depreciation, which means that our total expenses are lower. So that's yay, we don't have as much expense because that creates um, a bigger uh, taxable income, right? So yay again, except if we're in the 40% tax bracket, notice that we're paying 5.7 million in taxes instead of 3.1 million. Well, okay, fine, we're gonna pay 5.7 million, <clears throat> but we're paying 5.7 million on 14.2 million in, 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 in income. So, you know, which would you rather have? More income and more taxes or less income and less taxes? You know, so the idea here is to kind of lull you into a false sense of, of, uh, uh, of, of um, arrogance here, if you will, <laughs> that uh, you're actually better off. Now, remember, when I say better off, I mean, I care, uh, net income is a nominal number. I really care about cash flow because cash flow is the actual amount of cash that I get to put in my pocket at the end of the year. Um, so which of these looks like the best from a net income perspective? Well, this one, right? This is the highest one because it winds up with 8.5 million in, in net income because they didn't take any depreciation. All right, so now we have, we've laid out um, our net incomes for the four different variations, uh, or the three, ver the, the not-for-profit, uh, uh, Sunnyvale, and it's three variations if it were prof if it were for profit. Okay, so we've got four stories here. Now, to get to, from net income to our estimate of cash flow, we're going to take net income and add back the non-cash expenses. Well, the only non-cash expense uh, in this um, uh, in this story, in this financial statement, is the depreciation, which is 6.4 million. So we're going to add 6.4 million to our net income for each of these three um, uh, variations. And then because we don't have any depreciation, we don't have any other non-cash expenses, we're gonna add zero to 8.5 million uh, for the net income here. So adding zero to 8.5 million gives us our cash flow of 8.5 million. Now, obviously looking across here, um, we wind up with uh, the best uh, organization is the not-for-profit. Why? Well, because they didn't pay any taxes at all. Um, and so they wind up with 7.8 plus 6.4. So they wind up with 14.2 million. Um, next best, of course, is if you only pay 20% uh, taxes and then 40% taxes. But in these cases, the depreciation provided a shield, right? A depreciation, what we refer to as a depreciation shield for the organization. Uh, so that they paid less, uh, they wound up paying less taxes uh, uh, as a result of their depreciation. Um, so, so how much uh, of a shield does the um, uh, does depreciation provide to the organization? Uh, well, the way to calculate that um, is to compare what the organization would have paid uh, in taxes if it had if it didn't have depreciation. So our strong our, our comparison case and our strong our, our comparison case are, are these two. Uh, here you have Sunnyvale paying a, a tax rate of forty percent. Here you have Sunnyvale paying a 40% tax rate, uh, but in the second case, they have no depreciation. So how much, uh, how much does, the tax, does the tax bill get reduced as a result of having depreciation? Well, we can just simply compare um, uh, the amount here and say, okay, 5706, which is the tax bill um, without depreciation, Minus 3144 with depreciation is 2562. Um, and if you take, um, so 2562, the difference between 
5706 and 3144. If you take 40% um, of 6405, you will find that 40% of 6405 is 2562, which is the difference between um, the tax bills for these two columns. So real quick switching. Um, so if I have, bring my mic over here. <coughs> so how much do I save? Uh, what is my depreciation shield? Depreciation shield is equal to the tax rate times the amount of depreciation. Right. So in this case, um, the, tax, the, the tax rate was 0.4 and the amount of depreciation was 6,405. So 0 0.4 times 6,405 is 2,562. Okay. Um, in the 20% case, we don't have a comparison column for the 20% case. Um, we could just, we could calculate it though, of course. Um, so the, with the, uh, let me switch. So the 20% case, uh, we have, we know how much we would pay in taxes with the 6405 in depreciation. Without the 6405 in depreciation, we would have had taxable income of 14265. So, so <clears throat> 14265 times 0.2 um, gives us 14, let me see, 14265 times 0.2 gives us uh, 28.53. Um, and so our savings would be uh, 2853 minus 1572, uh, 1281. Um, 0.2 times um, 6405 is 1281. So let me um, demonstrate that. So uh, remember, without the um, depreciation, we would have, uh, this would have had, uh, this column, a, a matching column would have taxable income of 14,265,000. Um, so 14,265,000 times 0.2 gives us um, uh, taxes of 2853. Uh, what we found when we had depreciation was our taxes were 1572. So the difference is 1281. Um, if we had, so using our formula for the, for the depreciation shield, which is the tax rate times the amount of depreciation, the tax rate in this case is 20% times the amount of depreciation is 6405. 0.2 times 6405 is 1281. So you can estimate, um, the or you can calculate the depreciation shield if you know how much depreciation um, uh, you have and you know your tax rate. Okay, so there'll be a couple of problems on that in the text. Oop, there we go. So, um, Calculating Sunnyvale's change of equity. Um, so Sunnyvale had net income, right, or uh, uh, excess of revenue over expenses in 2015 of 7860000 Now, because Sun assuming Sunnyvale is a uh, not-for-profit, it, um, it cannot pay out dividends, so it must retain all of its earnings. So net income is equal to retained earnings in the case of a not-for-profit because they can't pay out any dividends. Um, so we would simply take the net income, add it to the amount of equity they had at the beginning of the year, 
and it would give us the amount of equity they have at the end of the year. Um, and so equity is the share, the value, the portion of the value of the organization that are owned by the shareholders or in the case of a not-for-profit um, is owned by the, uh, by the entity. Okay. Um, for a um, kind of a, a for-profit, so if we were to assume um, that this was instead uh, a, a, um, a for-profit entity, they have the a for-profit entity would have the choice. So it has 7,860 in net income. It would have the choice of paying dividends or not paying dividends. So in 2014, it paid no dividends. And so net income minus dividends paid is zero. So 8,206 minus zero gives us 8,206. So their increase in the amount of equity that they have uh, is 8,206. We add the 8,206 to their beginning equity in 30, uh, uh, of 38,002. Um, so 8,206 plus 38,002 gets us to 46,208. In 2015, they had net income of 7,860 and the shareholders decide they want to pay themselves uh, $2,000 in dividends. So 7,860 minus 2,000 uh, gives us uh, 5,860. And um, so now we add the 5860 to the beginning equity, which we get from, from last year's ending equity, right? Last year's ending equity becomes this year's beginning equity. So imagine you had a $46,208 in your, in your bank account on December 31st. That would be your ending balance for 2019, right? 46208 And then on January 1st, your beginning balance for your account would be whatever the ending balance was last year, which is 46208, assuming you didn't earn any interest overnight. Um, so our beginning balance is our ending balance from last year, plus an increase in equity because we had uh, earnings, we paid out some of it, and then we kept the rest. So our equity increases um, from 46,208, 46,208 plus five, uh, 5,860 gives us 52,068. Okay. So the statement of changes in equity um, helps to reconcile uh, the income statement net income item with the balance sheet equity account. And so those two things have to always uh, work together. Uh, for a not not for profit, uh, the entire amount of the net income flows to the balance sheet, um, so it's added um, as an unrestricted net assets. Uh, it increases the unrestricted net assets account, uh, and we'll look at that uh, in chapter four uh, in more detail. Uh, for a for profit uh, business, uh, when you have your net income. Uh, that can be reduced by the dividends. So, so the owners can decide to pay themselves a dividend and then whatever else is left is retained as retained earnings. Okay. So almost done here. Um, we have one example. Uh, well, we should have two examples here. I'm going to add one more. Um, uh, and so uh, two ratios that we talk about in the text uh, for chapter three, our total margin or profit margin and um, operating margin. So total margin, um, so we're gonna use, when we, uh, one of the things we, we want to do with our financial statements is conduct financial condition analysis. So we're going to, one of the important ways that we do that is we calculate ratios, right, because Simply saying, we had seven million eight hundred sixty thousand dollars in profit this year. Uh, I, I don't know if that's good or bad, right? I have to be able to compare it to something. Um, so I could compare it myself to myself over time, 
Um, and if my total margin, excuse me, if my net income is going up, I'll generally say, well, that's a good thing. But what if I'm earning, you know, say twice as much money and my net income is only 10% greater. So maybe my revenues have doubled, but my, um, but my net income is only 10% more. Am I doing well? And the answer would, you know, kind of would depend, but generally speaking, the reason that you're, if you've doubled your revenues, but your, um, but your net income has only gone up by 10% would mean that your expenses increased almost as much as your revenues. And you're not doing a good job of converting revenues into profit because you're not managing your expenses very well. And that's what total margin tends to can tell us is how effective is an organization at managing its expenses. Because the difference between total revenue and net income is expenses, right? Because because net income is total revenue minus expenses. So the bigger this percentage is, the more that more revenue is being converted into income and not going out the door in the form of expenses. Okay. So total margin is useful for helping us look at how effective our organization is at expense control. Because the closer net income is to total revenue, the smaller our expenses are. Um, And so what we'll do is we'll want to compare total margin, this percentage, uh, to other organizations. So if the average organization is earning 7% 7% total margin, and we're earning 4.5% total margin, then we're not doing very good. But if the average organization is earning 3% total margin, uh, and we're earning 4.5%, then we are doing pretty good. Okay. So that is um, uh, one way of um, uh, of of, of interpreting that and one one example of a ratio. Now uh, I'm afraid I I didn't I I didn't realize that the the book slides didn't have operating um, uh, margin. So I'm going to do that uh, right now with and pen and and do it in pen and ink. Okay. Instead of uh, making you suffer through seeing my handwriting. Uh, You'll see plenty of it when you go to do the problems. Um, I went ahead and typed in the operating margin ratio. So operating margin is operating income divided by operating revenue. So if we were to scroll back up, and I'm not going to do that right now, but if you were to scroll back up, um, or or go actually, well, you can't scroll up, but if you were to go back, uh, if you were to look at the slides, uh, uh, or you can go to your textbook, uh, and look at the Sunnyvale income statement, you'll see that their operating income right, is 3747 and their operating uh, and their operating revenue was 169,979. What's the difference between operating revenue and total revenue? Uh, operating revenue, uh, sorry, total total revenue includes both the operating revenue as well as the non-operating uh, revenue. So this is this number, the 174, is the 169 plus the contributions plus the gains from uh, uh, sale. Uh, sorry, plus the investment uh, uh, income that they earned. So when we divide 3.7 million by 169 million, uh, we get 0.22 or 2.2 percent. So. Um, the difference between total margin and operating margin is total margin includes all of the revenue uh, that the organization brings in, uh, whereas operating margin focuses just on the core business. Both of them are important, um, but they tell you slightly different things. Both of them are really telling you about expense control, but operating margin really focuses you on the expense control in the core business, whereas total margin has some other cats and dogs added into it that um, I find it a little less useful um, and a little less accurate, um, you know, if you're trying to judge an organization as a going concern. All right. So um, 
I have produced a separate video where I walk you through an actual hospital income statement. So a lot of uh, the, the, um, uh, uh, a lot of the examples in the text are super simplified. Um, I took an actual hospital income statement with a, <clears throat> a lot of, a lot more detail and I walk through it line by line. I'll put a link um, to that video in this video's um, description so that if you'd like to watch it, um, you can. It is, it's a long uh, video because there's a lot of information, but it, you know, it might be worth it if you're not familiar with this stuff. It might be worth it to watch it one time. Okay, so this concludes our discussion of chapter three. Um, so I, uh, you're not, you should, uh, if you're, um, if you are participating in uh, uh, either my uh, physician leadership class or in my class here at UNH, uh, uh, you know, you should be reading the text because this presentation doesn't cover all the details, uh, particularly if you're one of my students here at UNH uh, in my class. This warning definitely applies to you. Just because we didn't talk about it uh, in this presentation doesn't mean you're not responsible for it. All right. So uh, thanks for your time. I hope this was useful to you. Um, and I will see you in class.